Okay, hi everyone. As promised, we're coming to you from WISC, our news conference room, actually, um, where we have meetings every day. But we have Dean Strang with us today, and I know a lot of people have been kind of buzzing about this on social media because they wanted to talk to you directly. Okay. <laughs> so thank you for spending time with us. Thank you for having me. I said, if you could ask Dean anything, what would you ask him? So we have a list of questions already, and then hopefully people will pop in and ask questions as well. So we'll see. The first question is from Joshua. And Joshua asks, why was no one held accountable for the obvious fraud, tampering of evidence, and misconduct of office? You know, a, a criminal trial is all about whether you're going to hold the one person accused accountable or not, whether he is proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt or not. The conduct of other people may have a bearing on the verdict as to the guy on trial, mm -hmm. but um, a criminal trial at least doesn't address other people's responsibilities or failings. Right, so someone else would have to have another, you'd have to go another step. Someone there would have to be a civil else. trial or, or some other, you know, administrative proceeding. Becky wants to know, she says, I would ask Dean Strang why he didn't put his client on the stand. The jury would have better understood Avery and realized he wasn't capable of thinking through a murder and cover-up. That's a really understandable question, obviously. It's also where we bump into the lawyer-client privilege to which Stephen's entitled and, and will be entitled after he, he and I are both dead. Um, so I can't talk about that directly. I, I think what what I would want people who don't, you know, live and work in courtrooms to understand is that it, it's not the lawyer who decides whether the accused will or will not testify. It has to be, and rightly is, the accused's decision whether to testify or not. And there are all kinds of reasons innocent people don't testify. Like what? It may, they may be very poor public speakers. They may be afraid of speaking publicly. They may not be native English speakers. Now, I'm mm -hmm. not talking about Stephen or, or anybody in particular. Um, they may have done other things that will come out and make them look bad if they testify. Maybe they've got prior convictions. Those are admissible if you testify. There are also reasons that guilty people do testify. Mm -hmm. You know, they they want to put one over on the jury or they're sure they can talk their way out of it or whatever. So it, it's a much more complicated decision for the accused with advice from lawyers um, than just, boy, if I didn't do anything wrong, I'd get up there and, and tell 12 strangers I didn't do anything wrong. It really, it's, it just really is not that easy. Okay. Um, but that was ultimately his decision. Ultimately is and rightly must be his decision. Aaron wants to know, why did they allow the evidence from the Manitowoc Sheriff's Department to be used in court when they were specifically told they could not search the property? Well, the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department was the agency that decided it had a conflict and decided that it would not participate or at least told the public that. Now, in fact, almost all of the physical evidence either initially was found by a Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department employee or was initially in their custody. The key, the, blood. the car, the Sheriff's Department was the first to get there after a civilian found the car, you know, the bones, you name it. Um, but that was a decision that the department made not to participate. We had no legal right to insist that the evidence was no good simply because of who may have found it. I see. Okay. Tom says, first of all, Mr. Strang, I think you and Mr. Buting did an excellent job of presenting reasonable doubt in the face of clear prejudice. How did you overcome the obvious disappointment that you must have felt? I've lost before. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, not, it's not my first rodeo, as the, as the saying goes. Um, and indeed, if you're defending cases, you lose most of the time, no matter what... Um, bravado or bragging you may hear from lawyers. Um, so it's hard to lose, um, but for me I'd, I'd, I'd rather make the effort and be in the fight than not join the fight at all. Sure. Has this case haunted you or stayed with you? I thought yes. you said that, yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it's one of a number that, that have stayed with me. Um, is it true that Stephen Avery's jury contained the father of a Manitowoc County Sheriff's deputy and the wife of a Manitowoc County clerk of courts employee 
And if so, why did the defense allow this? And why was it not mentioned in the Netflix series? The jury did have the father of a sheriff's deputy on it. And there was a connection, there was a relative who was connected to the clerk's office, and I've lost the details of that. One of the reasons for that is you don't pick a jury. What you do is remove uh, the potential jurors you most want to remove, but you, you only get, you know, six strikes for no cause at all once people have passed muster as, you know, plausibly unbiased and able to serve. So you really only can remove, you know, the six people, mm -hmm. for example, who you're most concerned about. Were people removed from that? Oh, sure. Process? We exercised our peremptory strikes, as they're called, and the state exercised all of its. But you're left with some people that you wouldn't necessarily pick mm -hmm. were you, you know, making that choice at the outset. But you're, you're not selecting a jury. You're sort of deselecting people who are least um, fit to serve on the jury. Well, why wasn't it moved to a different city, town, or county? That's what uh, Rosalba wants to know. Which is a very good question. Um, and the, the answer to that, right or wrong, was that after the March 2, 2006 press conference that the lead prosecutor held at about 3 in the afternoon, there wasn't a county in the 72 counties of Wisconsin we could have gone to that wasn't massively affected by that lurid press conference, which only later proved to be largely unsupportable by the facts, but it was there mm -hmm. almost a year before the trial. So we opted to stay with the jury in the county that at least was familiar with this sheriff's department and probably most familiar with the history of Mr. Avery's involvement with the sheriff's department. There really was nowhere we could have gone where we would have had a jury that was a blank slate. Would you, would you do that over again? Or would yeah, you probably, but, but the next lawyer might make a different strategic decision on that. I probably would make the same. The next lawyer might make a different decision and she might be just as reasonable as I. As you know, like a lot of people have come out and said, um, you know, there was a lot of stuff missing in the Netflix documentary or you've probably read, you know, some of the things that people are writing online. Um, Susan wants to know, what is the 80 to 90 percent of the evidence the prosecutor says is not in the series? I don't know if you can a actually answer that, but was there anything that you thought major was left out? No, I, I don't think there was anything really significant uh, in the prosecution case that was left out or omitted. And indeed, um, the documentary includes some information suggesting guilt that, that wasn't presented to the jury, that wasn't in the evidence. Uh, now, necessarily, when you're collapsing six weeks of evidence to four or five or six hours on film, you've, you, know, you've, you, you can't include everything. So much defense evidence was left out, but not significant defense evidence. It, it was at least hinted at. And much, I think, less significant prosecution evidence necessarily was left out. But viewers of this documentary will see the key points that both sides made. Michael had a good question, and maybe you've heard of this, but you know the group Anonymous? Yes. So Anonymous has said that they're going to release phone records between Link and Colburn. Um, could those records be used in court to help uh, prove both men's innocence? Well, it would depend what's on the records. Uh, in and of themselves, the phone records might well be admissible if there was um, you know, a legal means to get the case back into court, and that would probably be uh, arguing that there's new and significant evidence. Lisa wants to know how can they charge Avery for it happening in the garage and Dassey in the bedroom and so forth because the two don't even match so how can they be charged for crimes that don't match up? That's a very troubling part of these two cases at a systemic level and the, the formal question there from a lawyer's perspective would be, does due process allow the prosecution to present inconsistent theories of guilt in two separate trials? Does it normally happen that way? I mean, have you seen that happen before? I have seen it happen before, and, and the, the case law, the courts um, on this have been, I think, disappointingly unclear about what the limits are of the prosecution's ability to do that. 
that the sort of crystallizing case to understand the problem would be, let's say, a death penalty prosecution where there are two defendants charged, but it's clear from the ballistic evidence that there was only one shooter. Mm -hmm. And if it's a death penalty case and, and a state with the death penalty is seeking uh, death against both defendants, they're entitled to separate trials. So we've had situations where when defendant A goes to trial, the prosecution argues that A was the trigger man and deserves death. Then when defendant B goes to trial, the state argues actually B was the trigger man and he deserves death. And that really, I think, puts in stark relief the problems with that. And I, regardless of what the courts say, if ultimately my profession should be dedicated to a search for the truth, presenting irreconcilable theories to do two different groups of citizen jurors can't possibly serve a search for truth. Right. Anne wants to know, she watched the series, she thought that the defense was well thought out, but is there anything that you would have done differently in presenting the case? You know, I would have done things differently the very next day. If, if we got mulligans or do-overs in life and stuff like this, you'd always do something differently. I, eight and a half years later, I can't, you know, readily think of this specific question that would have been different or this specific line of um, questioning or line of argument that would have been different. But I guarantee you, because I'm human and I grow over time and um, and learn, I hope, that there are things I do differently today. That's one of the burdens about living with a static outcome, a loss, um, but all other aspects of life being dynamic. Um, you, you learn and you grow, but you don't get to bring that back to the past. Yeah. You do still s see Stephen, though, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. When Jerry and I both do. Oh, really? Okay. Um, what are his legal options? I mean, I know, I think I know because we, I watched the, the series, but um, just if anyone's watching here and they want to know what is next. There are few. Him. There are few. His legal options realistically would lie in the area of newly discovered evidence that really might raise significant questions about innocence that weren't presented to his jury in 2007. So possibly if something was like really, you know, mind-blowing if anonymous really did find something in phone calls or something or like that, that. Or, a, or a witness who comes forward with a secret they've been holding um, an advance in scientific testing that might be applied to the blood the, or okay, yeah. you know. but that blood is really I mean we were talking about how the test came out and just how it is so hard to prove one way or the other correct I mean the EDTA you, you can't prove it's not there if you don't know the detection limits of your test right, right, and right. and that was a problem and it also another problem there was that the state's testing truly was ongoing during the trial mm -hmm. so we never had a chance to to do defense testing you know in an adversarial system one side got to do a test and the other did not i am curious how has this changed um like your perspective on the case now that you've seen it in a 10-part series <laughs> Uh, on Netflix. There was a lot of Brendan Dassey's case that I never saw until until I got to you know this documentary. So that much of Brendan D Dassey's case was really new to me. Not all of it, but much of it. Um, and do you want to tell people about just kind of the response that you've received over the last? 11, 12 days, and people have really come out all, all over the world, <laughs> really, right? It's been a lot. Um, it's been a lot. And um, I've appreciated it. Um, many of the comments I've gotten have really been extraordinarily thoughtful mm -hmm. comments, whether they agreed or disagreed with the outcome of the trial or you know, thought the defense did or didn't do a good job. M many of the comments I've gotten have really been very thoughtful. Um, so that's a credit uh, to people who are watching the, seri the, the documentary. Yeah. I think that no matter what you uh, what you believe, just the idea of how broken our justice system can be. And it matters. Yeah. The, the consequences of its failings are huge. Laura says, I've seen the whole series. It was an awesome series. Feeling 
wonderfully straying about my, oh about my straying crush. I told you we're getting a lot of I'm getting a lot of people who um, have crushes on my my wife finds this very <laughs> very hard to believe. I mean very hard to believe. Oh my gosh. Um, well, Greg has a question. Obviously, your legal obligation is simply to protect your client, but do you have a feeling on who else may have done this crime if not your client? And I don't know if you want to answer that question, but even if you do, you don't have to say who it is. Well, I, right. It wouldn't be fair right. to name names. It's just, it's, it wouldn't be fair to name names. Um, there, there were a number of people who I thought had the same opportunity as Stephen Avery t to commit this crime. And, you know, at, at least the same motive would be because there never was a motive ascribed to Stephen mm -hmm. for doing this. Um, well, Amanda actually brought up the Star 67 phone calls. Mm -hmm. So she says, what is his take on Kratz saying Avery made phone calls to Hallback and Star 67? I think that Kratz said that there were three phone calls made from Stephen Avery to Teresa Hallback on the day she disappeared, if I'm right. I, I don't remember you if don't it was three, but I know okay. there, was a, there, was, there was, I think, more than one. Um, at least one, as I recall, I'm going back eight mm -hmm. and a half years now, used star 67. Um, Stephen is someone who, not surprisingly, was pretty protective of his privacy. Um, so. That's, okay. Um, anything else that you want to add? We're actually out of time, so. If I were going to add anything, it would be as compelling as the story of these two trials is, regardless of whether you think they're guilty or innocent or you're just not sure. Regardless of that, I, I hope people will think more broadly about the systemic failings or weaknesses um, that the documentary presents. Because, you know, we, across this country, in however t many tens of thousands of counties there are in this country, we try people every day. And sometimes the consequences aren't what they were here, you know, with life. I mean, often they're not, you know, the potential of life in prison or worse. But the consequences are real, and they, and they have real human impact on victims, on defendants. Um, and when we, when, we, when we don't have confidence in the workings of the system, I think we have an obligation to address those with humility and with open minds and try to work towards a system that makes fewer mistakes. Yeah. How do you do that? You talk about it <laughs> and you raise it and you try to do the best you can today and you try to keep in mind that everyone in the system is human. They have failings, they have strengths, they have weaknesses. And I think a basic humility about the human limits of the ability to administer justice is for me the starting point. Yeah. Yeah, I do think that's a very interesting point because even in like some of the reporters I know, you know, they've said, well, I, I knew he was guilty, you know, they, and um, I said, well, there's a good chance you don't know everything. You know, I mean, you have to understand, and I even say that when we cover stories, just because someone's convicted still doesn't mean that person is. And it's worse. It's yeah. worse, Michelle, because yeah. at the end of the trial, if you were on the jury, and if that trial went six weeks and you attentively listened to everything that was said by everybody in that trial, there's an extraordinarily good chance that at the end of that process, you still won't know everything. Yeah. You still won't have real certainty yeah. about what happened or why or, or how. The object of justice, of, a, of a, an earthly system of justice, is to seek the truth. Seeking does not mean you always find it yeah. or that you can be certain that you have. It's the seeking that's the aspirational goal. Thanks so much, Dean. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for all of our viewers out there. Hey, bye. A new Netflix documentary has reignited interest in a high-profile Wisconsin murder case that vanished from public spotlights. Making a Murderer is about Stephen Avery, who spent 18 years in prison for a rape that he didn't commit. He was exonerated in 2003 by DNA evidence. But two years later, Avery was back behind bars for the murder of Teresa Halbach. Here's CBS's Michelle Miller. You know, we're all victims. 
You know, and they just won't leave us alone. They just keep it up and keep it up. When it became clear he was the suspect in Teresa Halbach's death, Steve Avery claimed he was being set up. Yeah, but if there's a crooked cop. So some, you're telling me somebody planted the body? I didn't do it. Who did it? I don't know. Halbach's car with Avery's blood in it was discovered in the Avery family salvage yard. The 25-year-old's cremated remains were just steps away from his trailer. Avery's teenage nephew, Brendan Dassey, even confessed to being an accomplice. All right, I'm just going to come out and ask you, who shot her in the head? He did. Why didn't you tell us that? Because I couldn't think of it. Avery's supporters say police manipulated a frightened boy with a learning disability. He later recanted to his mother. Did you? Huh? Not really. What do you mean, not really? They got to my head. Halbach was raped and murdered in 2005, one year after Avery filed a $36 million civil lawsuit for his wrongful conviction. That suit had embarrassed several law enforcement officials in Manitowoc County, exposing possible misconduct in the 1985 rape case. Two officers from that case also worked the Hallbach investigation and helped find her car keys inside Avery's bedroom. I'm at Avery Salvage. Investigators were on the salvage yard for eight days looking for clues. I didn't see them plant evidence with my, my own two eyes. I didn't see it. But do I understand how human beings might be tempted to plant evidence? I don't have any difficulty understanding those human emotions at all. Avery was convicted in 2007 for the Hallbach murder and sentenced to life in prison. Filmmakers Laura Ricciardi and Moira Demos spent 10 years working on making a murderer. We were very thorough and, in our opinion, very accurate and very fair. Former Calumet County District Attorney King Kratz told CBS This Morning the Netflix series leaves out key DNA and other evidence including cell phone records showing Avery lured Halbach to the salvage yard. Kratz, the special prosecutor appointed to the case, said the suggestion investigators framed Avery was, quote, irresponsible and inconsistent with a consideration of all the evidence presented. The filmmakers say their goal was to document Avery's case as it unfolded in its entirety. Our question going in was never about guilt or innocence or about trying to solve this crime. It was really an exploration into the system. And the 10-part documentary series is becoming an international sensation. Stephen Avery was defended by lawyers Jerry Buting of Brookfield and Dean Strang of Madison. Dean, welcome to Live at Four. Good to see you. Thank it's so you great having. to have a chance to talk to you about something the entire country is talking about now. This documentary premiered December 18th, and I wonder how your life has changed in the last 12 days. What has the reaction to this been like for you? Well, the, the, you know, the 12 days of Christmas here have been <laughs> different than the 12 days before that, uh, quite a bit. How has it changed? Oh, I've, I've gotten hundreds, hundreds of emails from around the world, um, calls, um, you know, just just in a sort of an onslaught of um, attention to the series, some of which gets directed or focused on on me because you know you can get my email on the internet. Well, let's talk a little bit about how the documentary filmmakers came to you. At what point in the case did they approach you with this idea and did you know what you were getting yourself into? Did you know you were <laughs> making a ten year commitment at the time? <laughs> Uh, they approached us early, it would have been in 2006 sometime, after they had approached the Avery family. Um, we took, I, you know, Jerry and I took direction from the client on this, um, but, but nonetheless were, I think, slow to warm up uh, to the idea. We ultimately did um, cooperate extensively with the filmmakers, in part because it was clear that they were really bright and thoughtful um, and I had no idea where the storyline was going um, you know either in, in real life or as as they would perceive it and present it also had no idea what the end product would be I doubt they had any idea what the end product 
would be, but um, I, I found them to keep their word in terms of being thoughtful, fair um, documentarians. They were film students in New York City, and when Stephen was released from prison the first time, that's what piqued their interest, and they came out to Wisconsin. They were everywhere. Wait, did, did they ever get in the way with you? No. no. They're in your car while you're talking out loud? Right, and they, that... I say they didn't get in the way because I agreed to let them in my car, and and actually the the, the equipment is pretty unobtrusive um, these days. So it was a new experience for me, um, and trying not to drive the car off the road. <laughs> um, but but no, they really didn't get in the way. Did you watch what you said around them? Well, sure. Well, whichever way you uh, are leaning in terms of Stephen's guilt or innocence, this thing will break your heart. And you said in the documentary that you hope that this time around Stephen is actually guilty because the alternative would be too much to bear. That's, a, that's a selfish hope. Do you think Stephen is innocent? I don't know. I've never known. I, what, I, what I do know is I'm nowhere near certain that he's guilty. And that, that's why I feel it as a burden, selfishly. And it, I don't hope that he's guilty for his sake or anyone else's. That it's, um, it's just, you know, I, I lost his case. I've got to sleep at night and get up and work the next morning. And so that is, in a sense, a selfish hope. And I really have deep, deep lingering doubts, you know, more than eight years after this trial about w whether the system got it right. Let's uh, talk about the trial in just a little bit. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to Live at Four. We're continuing our conversation about the documentary Making a Murderer with Stephen Avery's lawyer, Dean Strang. Welcome back. Where are all the principals today? Ken Kratz? Ken Kratz is practicing law in uh, Superior, Wisconsin, as I understand. And the Avery parents are still running the junkyard? The uh, Avery Auto Salvage, yep. And how are yes. they doing? I think as well as can be, ex as can be expected. Mm -hmm. And you saw Stephen in prison just December 17th. What is, what's his mood, his emotion? Um, stoic. Um, the, the Stephen Avery that Netflix viewers see in this documentary is the Stephen Avery. Um, there isn't a facade. Um, so he, he's very much as viewers will come to know him. He seems very even keel, very, he thinks about his answers. He's stoic. Um, I, I think he, he processes slowly. Um, and, and in that sense, yes, he is, I, I agree. I think he is even keel in that sense. Teresa Halbach's family has not spoken publicly since the documentary was released, but they did release a statement before it premiered, and they said, people are creating entertainment out of our story, and they are saddened that people are profiting from their loss. And you mentioned Ken Kratz earlier, the former Calumet County District Attorney who prosecuted this case. He has had a lot to say about the fact that a bulk of evidence for his side was not shown in this documentary. Have viewers been denied seeing a big piece of this story, do you think? I didn't think so. Understanding that the trial in which Mr. Kratz and I participated went six weeks of evidence and, you know, a film isn't going to go six weeks. It, you know, what did they give this, three, four, five hours? A lot. Ten hours, but, yeah. Well, but the actual trial was, oh, was yeah. some fraction yeah. of the 10 hours. Um, uh, I, th I thought that the, the significant evidence for the state, including some evidence pointing to guilt that the jury didn't hear, that, you know, that wasn't evidence at trial, was included, and that most of the significant evidence for the defense was included. Now, less significant evidence um, for both sides necessarily was excluded. Just, again, you can't take six hours and or six weeks and turn it into a few hours without excluding something. I think what makes some people upset is the Manitowoc County, the Sheriff's Department, people that are involved in this case were also involved in wrongly accusing him of sexual assault in 1985. I think that's what, that's what has upset a lot of people. Well, and, and this is, I, I hope that this documentary will be a, a good vehicle to broaden the scope and, and think about some more systemic issues. Apart from, you know, a given case or the outcome in a given trial or another trial, however compelling and important that is, 
there are broader systemic issues because Manitowoc is one of 72 Wisconsin counties. Wisconsin is one of 50 U.S. states. Um, you know, some of the systemic concerns that come to light in this documentary are pervasive um, and I think worthy of a broader dialogue. Well, in fact, that's one of the things you said that really stuck with me in the documentary. You said in some ways in our current criminal justice system, if you are accused, you lose. That you can fight to get your freedom and your liberty back, but you never really get your reputation back. No. So is our criminal justice system broken? In the way that all human undertakings are broken, yes. It's broken. Uh, is it, you know, is it more broken than anything else we humans set about to do collectively? I don't know, but I do know the consequences of its failings are greater than the consequences of an officiating failure on Sunday afternoon in the NFL, or a little more impact. You know. All right, we're going to wrap things up in just right after break. Can you stay a few more minutes? Sure. All right, we'll be right back. A couple more questions in just a second. We have time for a couple more questions with Dean Strang and a reminder that Dean will be taking your questions live on our Facebook page at the conclusion of this broadcast. Get more specific there. So what's, what's next, if anything, for Steve Avery? Stephen's realistic hope lies in new evidence um, being discovered. And that might be, you know, either someone who's been carrying a secret for 10 years that, uh, that he or she has not disclosed, saw something, heard something, or it might be an advance in scientific testing. Um, but that's really where his realistic it, But it, it can't be an outcry from the public over this documentary. That's not enough. That's not going to move a court, I don't think. Since the documentary has aired, has it generated any leads? Yes, it has. And where, where those go and how fruitful they'll be, I don't know, but it has. Would you do this all again? Not the case, but the documentary? With, the, with, with responsible, bright, thoughtful filmmakers, yes. And they were? I thought they were. Um, and I, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, the answer I just gave would have surprised me. And what about Brendan Dassey, Stephen's 16-year-old nephew? He's 26 today. You didn't defend Brendan, but I understand he has a new defense team. And what are the prospects? He's, he's got a very strong defense team, and Will he is still in federal court. He's in federal court on habeas corpus. That's pending. That is a tragic case, that young man. Yes. They, they both are. Yes. Um, as a lawyer, I, Brendan's case pulls at you. Well, thanks for talking about this, and people can check out the Netflix series and uh, see what happens. Thanks for having me. Thanks Dean, for being thank here, you. Dean. We were, and Happy New Year. Appreciate it very much. We'll be right back.